This is an ABC podcast. Hello and welcome to this week's Health Report with me, Norman Swan. And me, Tegan Taylor. Today, research which suggests we should be taking more notice of our cholesterol levels when we're in our 30s rather than waiting till your arteries are clogged. Most of us have taken advantage of digital health in the last year, from telehealth to online prescriptions to our digital COVID vaccination certificates, if you can get them, that is. But what's next? And better equipping people to understand the complications when they need to have a partial foot amputation, which happens more than you might like to think. Yeah, well, listen to the health report. You might avoid it, but if you have to have it, there's important information with Tegan a little bit later. And as New South Wales opens up more this week at 80% vaccine coverage of the over 16s and Victoria marks the beginning of the end of its lockdown on Friday at 70% coverage, there is nervousness in both states about the extent to which cases will grow and the effect on hospitalisations, ICU admissions and deaths. Not to mention Queensland saying it's now going to open up you know, quite significantly on the 17th of December. Now, Denmark, which also opened up progressively, like we are doing, is now seeing a bit of a surge in cases since it opened up completely on September 10th. But countries which might make us more nervous are the UK, US and Israel, which have seen significant Delta surges and rises in severe disease. In the United States and Israel, the large unvaccinated populations are clearly an important factor. But increasingly, analysts are concluding that waning immunity to vaccines is playing a significant role, with breakthroughs in fully vaccinated people who were jabbed six months or more ago. It suggests that we in Australia should get onto this now with third doses at the beginning of our opening up rather than chasing the issue when people are in ICU or dying. Professor Rhina McIntyre is an infectious disease and vaccine specialist and a researcher and heads the Global Biosecurity Programme at the University of New South Wales Kirby Institute. Welcome back to the Health Report, Rhina. Good afternoon, Norman. So what do the international data show in terms of breakthrough infections, hospitalizations and the vaccinated and so on? So there's a, a quite a large volume of data now from multiple countries that are all showing the same thing, which is that after about five to six months, there is um, substantial waning, particularly of the Pfizer, also the AstraZeneca, let's so the Moderna and... Um, it's been seen, <clears throat> you know, in Canada, in the US, the UK, Israel, all the countries that have collected data. And it's kind of panning out that the uh, Moderna seems to have, you know, less less waning than the Pfizer, which has less waning than the AstraZeneca. So um, from in the UK, for example, um, you know, the effectiveness overall dropped from... 66% to 47% for AstraZeneca and from about 90% to 69% for Pfizer after 20 weeks. And the drop is particularly after the age of 50. So the studies that have looked at it um, by age show that um, the waning really is more severe for people over 50. Uh, and that's because there's a phenomenon called immunosenescence, which is the progressive decline of the immune system that happens to all of us after we reach 50. Um, and it really correlates well with the pattern of disease severity we see with COVID. Um, and, and In other words, the older you are, yeah. the worse you get it. Crudely. Yeah, and the less, less, uh, less you respond to vaccines. Now, just break it up for me, because there, there's two elements that they look at here in waning immunity. One is immunity to the infection itself, whether that be asymptomatic or symptomatic, and waning in the protection against hospitalisation and severe disease. What does yeah, it look like yeah. for those? So as time has gone on, you know, initially it looked like in the first, you know, up to the first sort of 15 weeks after vaccination, it didn't seem like hospitalisation and death was being affected that much. But beyond that period, both those outcomes start, you get waning against hospitalisation and death as well. So um, that's the concern and that's why the UK moved to giving everyone 50 and over a booster. And just on this booster thing, I mean, we in Coronacast, and Tegan and I in Coronacast have stopped using the word booster and starting to talk about third dose. I mean, is yeah. it fair to say that these vaccines, if they'd had more time to work out the dosage, they would have all yeah. been three-dose vaccines? 
Yeah, this is an evolving picture and, uh, you know, this isn't the end of the story with vaccines. We'll see different vaccine strategies. We'll see second generation vaccines. We'll see matched vaccines that are matched to the to the variants of concern. And in my view, it's going to end up being that it's a primary three-dose schedule. Uh, and many vaccines do need a primary three-dose schedule, so that's nothing new in the world of vaccines. And what would you expect the duration of immunity to be if it were to be a three-dose schedule? Um, we, we, we don't know because we haven't had long enough follow-up. Um, if we're seeing two doses starting to wane after five to six months, you know, maybe three doses will last a year or more. Um, it's hard to say, really. These are things we're going to learn along the way. And what we need to do is be able to pivot rapidly as the evidence becomes available. Um, and some countries are doing that and others are not. And by pivoting, you mean what? Sort of introducing the booster, the th third dose quickly? Yeah, yeah. So, you know, um, look at Israel, for example. They started vaccinating early. They have been very ambitious in their vaccine strategy. And then, you know, when everything started... Um, coming apart at the seams in, in June when they started having a resurgence, you know, they moved pretty rapidly um, as the evidence came through about the waning to bring in the booster. So I think, you know, we, we have to be ready um, to be, we have to be agile. Otherwise, um, you know, to prevent morbidity and mortality, we have to be agile. Well, we've got the benefit to some extent of having most of the population quite freshly immunised. But there are people, particularly in residential aged care, the frail elderly and also healthcare workers who who are now maybe seven or eight months after getting towards eight months after yeah. their first vaccine. Presumably they're quite vulnerable. As they we, are. As we we've, open we've up. We've already had, uh, we've heard at a New South Wales Health press conference that we had a fully vaccinated um, healthcare worker who ended up in ICU in, in a critical condition. So it's not necessarily a trivial thing for fully vaccinated people to get infected. And the waning really is an issue for everyone in 1A that was vaccinated in March, April, around that time. In terms of the opening up, we're going to be, I think the peak of vaccination, certainly in New South Wales, was around August. So, so we would be expecting to see the impact of the waning in the general community around February. But really, so what's your view in terms of should we be going back into residential aged care now with a, an intensive program? I think so. We're already seeing outbreaks in residential aged care and um, cases occurring in fully vaccinated people. Um, and, you know, those and other um, vulnerable institutional settings and healthcare workers, I think there is some urgency to, to get a recommendation, you know, to deliberate on and get some recommendations. Now, there's been, recent, re there's been a recent study of mixing and matching, and it's quite clear that mixing is the best strategy. Which vaccines are best? Because the Commonwealth has said Moderna and Pfizer is what they're going to use for boosters, or third doses, I should say. Yeah, I think that's, that's fine. You know, the um, data shows that, for example, an AstraZeneca followed by an mRNA vaccine gives a really good boost. The other way around, not so much. So um, generally speaking, you know, with, uh, I think it would be an mRNA booster um, if you, whatever vaccine you've had, unless you've got a contraindication to the mRNA vaccine, in which case you can have another AstraZeneca. Well, let's see how quickly the Commonwealth gets on its bike. Thank you very much, Raina. It's a pleasure. Professor Raina McIntyre heads the Global Biosecurity Programme at the University of New South Wales Kirby Institute. This is RN's Health Report. Probably without knowing it during COVID, we've become much more comfortable with what's called digital health, using information and communications technology in our healthcare. A lot of us would have had a, health, a telehealth consultation with our GP or specialist, or more recently wrestled with our digital identity and COVID-19 vaccine digital certificate. You may have even used your My Health record. Hopefully it won't take a pandemic to make another shift in Australia's digital health system. And to help find out what we'd actually find useful, the Australian Digital Health Agency is conducting a community survey and you still have a few weeks left to complete it. Amanda Catamol is the agency CEO. Welcome to the Health Report, Amanda. Thanks, Norman. Lovely to be here. So how has COVID changed things for Australia's digital health? 
uh, it, it has changed things in just about every way, Norman. We have seen the most remarkable acceleration in uptake and engagement with digital health right across the healthcare system and, of course, by Australian consumers. And I, I think we've seen, you know, a few examples of those. Well, they don't necessarily recognise that it's digital health, do they? It's just kind of... Routine it's stuff. exactly. It's just health. It is now just health. That's right. And, and I think what we're seeing now is um, people are expecting there to be digital tools available. And what we need to do is to make sure that we continue to keep up delivering digital tools, which which consumers will then use in in amongst wanting their more traditional ways of engaging with health, like face to face consults, but being able to also have a virtual one, grabbing a paper script or getting an electronic one. And, and it's really important that, you know, we're continuing to have this dialogue with what do Australians want out of their healthcare system, which will be underpinned by really changing, rapidly changing digital technologies, which is exactly why we're doing that survey that you mentioned in your intro. Now, one thing people don't want is to be left behind. So the elderly who may not have access to this or disadvantaged groups, um, the, the risk is with digital health that you're left behind in a digital um, desert. So I think the really critical thing about the way that we're seeing this now is that this is complementary to other ways of engaging the healthcare system. Um, we do not want to create a digital divide here. What we want to do is ensure that there are a whole range of ways that Australians can access their healthcare, whether or not it is face-to-face -face or virtual engagement, and always be able to have those other methods. But as well as that, I think given that we're seeing this rapid acceleration, and we really are, Australian consumers are embracing digital health as we call it, in, in a way that's just, you know, beyond anything we've seen before, is that we need to make sure that we're providing people the tools to do so. And so one of the ways that we do that is we're partnering with a really broad range of organisations who then provide opportunities for Australians in different parts of Australia to, to get that sort of what we call that digital health literacy, where they uh, can have um, local opportunities to improve their own experience and understanding of digital health and how they can access it. Now, my health record, I'm, I like say I'm a signed up fan, so I'll say that to start with, but it has been criticised for being clunky and having limited functionality. Where are you going with that? Because that's got enormous potential to really smooth out the system for people. 